Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi, and with me is Armin Navabi, as always. Hello. Hey, Armin. And uh, so uh, today we're, you know, we've been exploring um, a lot of really, really exciting young uh, activists from, or, or new activists uh, from all over the world uh, in the ex-Muslim community. Um, it, it, there's been a surprising surge of, of women speaking out. And, you know, we've had recently people from Somalia, uh, people from Australia. And uh, today we have Halima Salat. And Halima Salat is from uh, Kenya. But it's it's kind of an interesting background she has because she is from a Somali tribe uh, in northeastern Kenya. Uh, she is a journalist who worked for the state, um, the Kenyan state television. She was a TV reporter for them. Um she eventually rejected Islam. She moved to Holland, um, you know, and now she lives in Europe. Uh, so she has recently become very, very uh, open and um, vocal about her ex-Muslim activism. And she's also a, a poet, you know, who, who writes uh, really amazing poetry. Uh, so hopefully we're going to get to sample some of that. But anyway, before we go into anything else, uh, Halima, thank you for joining us and welcome to the podcast. It's an honor. Oh, thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, welcome. So let's start with uh, just where you're from. We recently had uh, a couple of people. We had Noon Benson and we've had Autumn Sharif, the singer uh, from yeah. Somalia. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about you know, the exciting things happening in the Somali ex Muslim community. So you're kind of both. You're part of the Somali, uh, a Somali tribe and Somali ethnicity in northeastern Kenya. So can you kind of explain um, where you're actually from and how all of that works for people who may not know? <laughs> the easiest way I normally explain is just say, you know, when the British came to colonize East Africa, they just drew a line in, in, in native grazing land, so to speak. Somalis are very nomadic people. And so right. they kind of, <clears throat> when they demarcated a whole province that's part of uh, Kenya is predominantly Somali. So my great great grandparents ended up on the, on the, on the, on the Kenyan side. But I do speak Somali, I write Somali, um, I've worked with Somali people, so I mean, I'm Somali, ethnically, but mm -hmm. I'm also Kenyan national. Yeah, and so the, so what happened, you said, one of the things that you told me was that uh, while, while you were growing up, when you say you were consciously ex-Muslim for about six years before you moved out of Kenya, so you yes. used the word consciously. But yeah. before Ali, before before yeah. you say that, uh, just to cl clarify for people that uh, you know don't know the, uh, Af African map, so you have Kenya and Somalia is to the east of Kenya, right? Northeast, yeah. east. Yeah. Uh, and basically, what they were what, when they were drawing the lines, it's this kind of that sounds like what when they were drawing the lines in the Middle East, um, they weren't very careful about wh who who ends up on what side. So you're saying they did the same thing on uh, in Africa, and a lot of Somalis, instead of ending up in Somalia, they ended up in Kenya. So that's what happened, right? Just yeah. to clarify what happened, right? Yeah, and that's not just between uh, Somalia and Kenya. It's also on the northern part mm. between <clears throat> Kenya and Ethiopia. And there's a large number of Oromo people on the, on the Kenyan side, Moyale, which is like the northern part. Uh, Kenya side. Right. So they also speak the same language with the Ethiopian uh, Oromo tribe. So it's right. it's it's not just on the on the Somali side on the on the Somali side that... of Kenya, but Kenya's yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but isn't that a good thing that you ended up in Ke like Somalia is a failed state right now, right? So isn't yeah. that a so it's better to be in Kenya than Somalia. <laughs> <laughs> right. Kind of. Kind of. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. Sorry, Ali. Go on. Yeah, so I, I was just really interested when you said that you you were already consciously ex-Muslim for six years, and, and you said that you used the word consciously, uh, deliberately, um, yeah. right? Which meant that uh, there were many things, even when you were Muslim, that you kind of knew that you didn't believe. So I, I'm just really interested in your family background. Where were you born? You grew up. What kind of upbringing did you have? And how did that lead to where you are now in terms of your belief? Actually, uh, well... I was born in Garissa, which is um, in northeastern Kenya. So it's kind of a little bit, uh, I, I can say it's a little bit different from the rest of, of Kenya in terms of like Nairobi. I moved to Nairobi later on in life, but uh, I, I lived in this very small village. 
um, in my growing up days. And I remember uh, very clearly <clears throat> that I was in primary school between the years of 1990. Uh, by the time I was finishing primary school, 94, well, so mm -hmm. I was in primary school earlier, 1994, when I was finishing my, my eighth year of primary school, we, we were already wearing, uh, as part of our school uniform, a lot of uh, a hijab. But I do remember the metamorphosis. You first didn't wear anything. It was just a shirt and a skirt. And then they introduced a little scarf. And then they introduced uh, uh, a bigger jilbab. And right now, when you uh, even search the internet, you see that the children are now wearing, as part of school uniform, huge, um, huge garment all the way to the legs uh, that is jilbab. So I do remember that. Oh. So this sort of this thing of this conservatism has really been more of an, a, a thing in the last couple of decades. I think so. It started uh, at least for for as far as. Oh, you're getting cut. You're I can getting remember cut. it started mm -hmm. with the... Am I getting cut? Am I there? No, you're yeah, re repeat the last part. Uh, as far as I can remember, around the time that war started in Somalia and a lot of Somalis moved into the northeastern part of Kenya, mm -hmm. that's when also that started. I can't really blame uh, uh, or say that was the, the cause of it. But I think the beginning of Wahhabism was around that time, both in Somalia and in Kenya. So, and by, by say beginning of Wahhabism, this is uh, Saudi Arabia uh, sending in um, Wahhabi do uh, doctrines to Somalia and to the Somali part of Kenya? Yeah, because I do remember also there were so many charities that were set up. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> right, that's how uh, they come in. I don't know if I can name them, but yeah, I do remember even the names uh, that... These charities were coming and they're building lots of mosques and there was lots of money into into and madrasas that and all that yes. kind of stuff. Yeah. Why is it so same everywhere? Like this is the same story for Afghanistan, for Pakistan, from Somalia, Kenya. Like it's just it just sounds so similar everywhere. Like oh, we, like in Pakistan, we didn't know the difference between Shia and Sunni, and all of a sudden we had. 200 more madrasas everywhere and now we realize that yeah, we have to hate the shias now the hijab is everywhere so like you see that like you see like it's the same it, 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 pa, uh, after 1979 after the revolution in iran it seems like the story on how wahhabism also spread as a reaction to that everywhere in islamic countries it just seems so the similar story is that is is that what you experience? Is that what you feel like? Well, like when you hear other people talk about what happened in Afghanistan and Pakistan or in other yeah. countries, is it is like deja vu for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of yeah. yeah, because it's kind of this is the as you grow older and you read stuff and you get exposed to the world. That's when then you say, oh, it's not. It wasn't that different. It's the same, right. uh, and you kind of start to see the patterns. Yeah, it's it's a form of this is the thing. It's. It's a form of colonization. There are many people who complain. Mm. It's amazing. There are a lot of people in the Muslim world who complain about the British. You know, we it's a problem. We just talked about it. British yeah. coming in and making lines and colonizing and changing everything, taking over the culture. But then, you know, you have uh, when Saudi Arabia and conservative Islamic ideology goes to all of these countries and just completely yeah, no, destroys. Nobody's about, yeah, nobody's talking talking about uh, Arab colonization as much as they're talking about Western colonization. And in mm -hmm. Africa, Arab colonization has kind of pretty much spread, I, I, I guess. And I mean, in the form of all these um, charities, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so th but when the, it seems like Saudi Arabia's budget is uh, starting to dry up, do you think like this is going to put it like uh, when the... Is that going to put an end out to all of this? No, I think that'll take a while to yeah. dry up. I don't know. Don't know. Uh, well, I feel like pe the people have sort of forgotten. I do remember very early, uh, very early when I was a small child, um, even my mom not putting on a very conservative clothing, but more like, a, you know, a, a little traditional uh, over the shoulder uh, mm. kind of thing. And, 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 and then as we're growing up, my mom enforcing the hijab uh, on us very strictly. And so you can see the, <clears throat> the changes that the 
societies have gone through. What what is the motive? What was your mom's motivation? Was it that, that she personally became more um, you know conservative, or is it because of the environment and you know adapting to the you know saving face? And becoming accepted in the community, like was it a pragmatic approach or was it a, a ideological approach that she? Put well, I think it's a in? bit of both. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a bit of both because if everybody is also like uh, becoming more conservative um, and 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 adopting that, and then it becomes part of um, part of life, and not not a lot of people then are remembering what you what life was before that or how they used to dress or or it wasn't that bad and and so i guess it's i guess i could say it's a bit both okay and kenya just to be clear kenya is mostly is 70 percent christian right yes so and the muslim it's it's around six percent muslim and is the muslim parts of kenya is that is it safe to assume that that's the Somali part of Kenya that is the six that is mostly uh, is the six part the six percent Muslim that contributes okay. to the six percent Muslim? Okay, I'll I'll maybe g briefly just say a little bit of geography. Uh, okay. Kenya has eight provinces, and mm. in these eight provinces, two of them are uh, predominantly Muslim, mm. and so you have the Swahili people on the coastal side. Mm. Um, who also got, uh, you know, influences from uh, Arab, uh, actually Swahili, there are people who are mix of Arab and Bantu <coughs> Kenyan, so they, call, they even call them, the tribes are called Swahili. Mm. And Swahili language in itself was born from, from a bit of uh, a mix of both. And so you have that that province that's predominantly also Muslim and the northeastern part of province Kenya, which are also predominantly Muslim, but also uh, like Somalis, one tribe, Somalis live in that region, the northeastern part. Okay, um, so these two provinces are the Muslim parts and the rest are Christian. And, and the, how do the Christians treat the Mus uh, Kenyan Christians treat the Muslims? <sighs> Well, in the recent years, there have been a, an upsurge of uh, terrorist attacks from Al-Shabaab across the border from Somalia. Right. And uh, Kenya uh, faced some really uh, terrible times. Uh, with There was a mall uh, attack. There was also mm. an attack on a university. Um, so as, as soon as those things started happening, then the, the, the Christian population, uh, would start to look at even somebody like me as I go back to your country. I'm like, this is my country. <laughs> right. <laughs> we read about those, I think. Right. Those attacks yeah. 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 So even though you're not a Muslim because you're, you're Somali, you get some backlash from the Christian because of the terrorist attacks. Um, yeah. so I guess, uh, are the Muslim and, and the, are the Christians there, uh, conservative with their Christianity, um, is it like a lot of Christian laws? Because I heard like the LGBT community is, is in Kenya is uh, has it really tough because of the Christian people there. Is that true? Exactly. So <laughs> basically, uh, um, I can say on a general homophobia in Africa is quite you know it's on the high. Right. And LGBT community have always have to fight. And but on paper, Kenya is supposed to have a, a we pa Kenya passed a new constitution in 2010. Mm. And in this new constitution, it's supposed to be like secular, and and they try mm. to separate state from religion. However, the leaders and the politicians are all you know um, from a Christian background, so they also have their influence. Their, I guess they're influenced by their religious uh, standing or their religious beliefs. And so uh, the LGBT community tried, uh, I think sometime early this year, to, to get one law revoked that doesn't allow them to get married. It's, okay. it's actually, it's, it's, it's a contradiction in the law. It says anybody is allowed is not supposed to be discriminated against uh, based on religion, race, and and sexual or orientation. But then it says, oh, marriage is only for men and women. So, okay, but but Kenya um, is good is relatively better uh, based on African standards, I guess, right? Like, I mean, compared to Uganda uh, for LGBT people, Kenya is a lot better, isn't it? 
Well, they are becoming a little bit more visible now and they're kind of fighting okay. and they're taking things to court and they are, they're really Thank trying. You. There's a lot of activists uh, uh, who are trying to change things, yes. I would say. Uh, and yes, of course it's not as bad as uganda because in in uganda it's enshrined in the law to to discriminate against i'm, I'm not sure i'm not fuck yeah very factual yeah uganda. but i'm very impressed that like I, I know like you're saying execution wise it's not very secular but the fact that they're even putting trying to make the laws more secular i mean that's pretty that's that's progress isn't it like aren't you optimistic about the direction things are going with kenyan laws I'm hoping, I'm hoping, uh, when you listen also to people, the general public, uh, I don't know if this is also from a cultural uh, perspective that people do, just don't like um, uh, LGBT people, it's just do, look down upon them, they look, it's shameful and, and there's a lot of ostracization and, you know, uh, fussing about the whole thing. Do we have atheist activism? Like Atheist Republic, uh, Kenyan consulate is, uh, is is getting more active. I think so. I, I mean, hopeful that. But do, do, you, do you have when? Do you notice any atheist activism, secular activism, in Kenya? I think I, you know, before I moved, if, if I could just give, before I moved to Holland, I was hiding or my, my atheism or mm. my, my, so I kind of didn't seek too much, um, too much people online, I could say. But mm. after arriving here, I've had a couple of uh, things like, uh, and I've seen a few interactions here and there, but not directly. Uh, right. So it's good that it's good. It, it's, you got cut. Oh, you got cut up. Active. That you got cut. Fantastic. Can you repeat that last one? It's good that they're getting active. Uh, that would be fantastic to to join and to interact with. I think a lot of atheists are ignoring um, a lot of African countries, um, and it's a it's a and it's the re and what the people that are not ignoring it are the Christians and Muslims. I think Christians and Muslims are recognizing how important Africa is. Uh, when it comes yeah. to the future and the ideological battles. And I think uh, the fact that atheist activists are not paying attention to Africa as much, especially, you know, the the, pop, the population growing fa in Africa faster than many other places. I think the future, the future of the world when it comes to the ideological battle, uh, you know, really could be determined by who controls, <laughs> who has controls the yeah, ideas that are... are <laughs> <laughs> who, who who has the highest control over what happens in Africa, right? And this is what China recognizes. Yeah. Uh, this is what Muslims, this is what the Vatican recognizes. Yeah. This is what Muslims recognize. Even Iran is recognizing that, right? So they all go in there. This clamor, yes. for, this clamor, this renewed clamor for Africa. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen, I've seen people like in many African countries doing like the Ashura and, and you know, people are, Iran is moving in and spreading the love for Hussein in Africa. Like, wow, these, like Iran doesn't like wait, like they really, um, I'm very, like they're scary, but I'm very impressed with how they are spreading. Like everybody, and I, and I think we are so far behind, like atheist, big atheist activist groups. The, they're not they're not moving uh, they're not trying to reach out as you know you don't even have to go and spread atheism in africa because atheist activists are already in africa you just yes. have to go find them and try to support like we need to go like find these groups and try to see how we could amplify yeah. their voices like, <coughs> excuse so, me for for the most part unfortunately what happens is that the uh, the Arabs, the Christians, everybody likes going to Africa to spread the message, and then they'll give them social services and start charities and do all kinds of things. Uh, but when trouble hits, and there are, like, this is the biggest problem. Like, uh, you know, the, the Arabs, you know, they come to Africa, they completely change, as you said, Somali culture and Kenyan culture. You know, people are now, they've shed their traditional dress and now are wearing the hijab and the, and the jilbab and all of that. But when trouble hits then and and people in africa die and there's war then yeah. nobody nobody no, really cares i mean <laughs> omar al-bashir sorry omar al-bashir you know the guy he who's responsible for the for the genocide in, in darfur it's amazing to me i mean he, he killed over half a million people like half a million people black african muslims died uh, in that in darfur 
in that whole conflict. And they were done by an Arab Muslim guy. Uh, yeah. If he had been a Jew, right? Or if he'd been, yeah, go ahead, Alima. No, go, go, go on. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just saying if it had been anybody else, if it had been uh, a Jew or been a Netanyahu or something or Ariel Sharon, it would have been, they, it was, they would have yelled. All the Arabs would have talked, oh, they're killing all these black Muslims. The Arabs would have been screaming about it, but because it's themselves that nobody, nobody really cares. So mm. that's, I think, also one of the neglected, um, it, it's just massively neglected. But isn't that, because, isn't that because isn't that because I know that racism in the world exists, uh, and the mainstream racism we know is normally from white people to brown people. But <clears throat> I personally think that Arabs are quite racist towards black people, um, mm. and and Islam itself, for me, sometimes when you get given this this whole uh, story of Bilal that has been overused all, over and over again, I'm like, no! <laughs> Bilal is a slave that, that joins <laughs> yeah, Muhammad's we'll find out. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I remember I, 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 uh, there was a brief period I also like uh, studied uh, the Quran and Hadith and I kind of wanted to re-believe. Uh, and I remember coming across these stories and I already was feeling like, okay, there's a lot of, um, you know, there was the history of slavery and then there's the, there's a lot of racism, uh, that you can feel it with interactions as well. Mm. Um, and then I was like, I want to find out what well, is, is, is that really true? Is like, uh, is, is Islam, uh, against racism or was, is there some sort of history? And so I remember I read a lot of text and I was like, okay, now I know. Yeah. But uh, Chris I Rock, mean, I, I, I just have to say one thing. Chris yeah. Rock said something. One of his famous quotes is that, uh, believing I'm paraphrasing. He said, believing Christians, uh, black people who are believing Christians have a very short memory. And I think that that would be true also of uh, yeah. you know, black people, yeah. Muslims, and just yeah. in the sense that it was just premised on all of these religions, Christianity and Islam, they're premised on, on slavery. I mean, they, they condone it. They, there's no place that says uh, you should not own slaves. All of the places say this is how you should sell them. This is how many shekels you should get for a male slave, for a female slave. And this is how you free your slaves. This is how you can have sex with your slaves. That That's what all the rules Nobody, there is no place in any of these religions in their scripture that doesn't capitalize on slavery. Um, and it's just been practiced the entire can time. I, can I just... To be fair to Islam, okay, and I don't say that often, but to, <laughs> yeah. but I, I want to be. Let's say, we're gonna we're gonna cut this part out and make it like a yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, I I shit on Islam all the time, right? But I think this is one situation where um, you can't you you can't you can blame Muslims, but you can't blame Islam. Uh, so to be okay. Islam, there's nothing in Islamic text that allows um, racism, right? And again, just to make it clear, I'm not, oh, I'm, not you, you, I'm not, wait, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I didn't hear you, you, you caught, okay. I didn't hear you. you so I said, I said, to be fair to Islam, there's nothing in Islamic text that allows racism. But, okay, to, to make it clear that I'm not defending Islam, it does allow slavery, okay? But not racism. Um, and this is, again, not to defend Islam because, um, again, it's, it's, allowing, it's allowing slavery, which is pretty, pretty bad. But technically, under Islam, it's true that all people are supposed to be equal under Islam. And again, and it's not a defense of Islam because it still has tribalism in a way that Muslims are superior to non-Muslims, so it has that form of tribalism, but it has it doesn't have the tribalism that suggests some races are superior to other races. As long as you're a Muslim, you're equal to your other Muslim, uh, as long as you're a man, by the way. So men are still superior to women, but um, so there's sexism, there is slavery, there is not racism in Islam. Muslims, uh, in practice, though, Muslims are extremely racist, like Arab Muslims see themselves as superior to non other Muslims. But there's nothing in Islamic texts that, that condones that, right? So I just want to be fair to what, what we can blame Islam for. We can blame Islam for slavery. We can blame Islam for sexism. But we can't blame Islamic texts and theology 
for racism. There's nothing. I, I have a I have a rebuttal to that, but Lee okay. might go first. Okay. Yes, I was I was really waiting. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, there's there's this phenomenon, I guess that I don't know whether it's really peculiar only to Somali um, Muslims that there's this narrative <clears throat> that they were that that came with a religious te text and religious imams and uh, you know that said that they are closer to Arabs, they have Arab descendants, so they sh uh, they should they should feel themselves better than other black people because uh, and, and the fact I don't know whether it was like a way to convert to convert uh, Somalis into into Islam or but there's this notion and this belief that among Somalis that you know that they feel they're better than other other black people because they're closer to Arabs which just doesn't make sense to me. Right, but is that is that, that in that's not in the Quran or the Hadith though? That's just I don't know what text that that came with, but it's predominantly there. Right. So 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 somebody could say, well, that's Muslims, not Islam, right? So that's just the Muslims being shitty yeah. racist people. <coughs> There's no Islamic text that supports that. So that's what I'm saying, right? If, yeah. if when it comes to slavery, you can I can show you a lot of texts in the Quran and the Hadith. I would look. Yes, look, Islam does condone slavery. Right. Or when it comes to sexism, I could show you a lot of hadith and texts in the Quran. They say, like, look, yes, Islam is a sexist religion. It's a but the, when it comes to racism, there's nothing I could show in the hadith or in the Quran that says, look, as it does. There's nothing there that sh suggests that there's yeah. one race is superior to another. But go on, so this is this is one of the things where, um, you know, again, I, I don't like getting into this literalist conversation, but when yeah. when the literalist thing happens, you know, you say yes, okay, slavery. It talks about slavery, but not racism. But in practice, the people who were owned as slaves back then, in in practice. those Meccan times, yeah, in in practice, it was understood that these people were Africans, right? Mm. So and there were black Africans. So this was this is more of a dog whistle, where uh, <laughs> you know, on a superficially, what they're doing is they're going out and saying, well, uh, we. Islam is for everybody as long as you convert, you know, you're Muslim, blah, blah, blah. But, but uh, un under the surface, in practice, even during the time of Muhammad, it wasn't like that. You, you look at the Hadith, you look at the Quran, uh, you look at the description of the virgins in heaven, their skin is so white, they are so <laughs> fair, that you can see their right. bone marrow. You yeah. can see that that's a Hadith. <laughs> First of all, I don't know why that I would be that <laughs> Automatically, we ain't gonna be among the virgins in heaven. <laughs> I know. If you see you see a a, a woman, right, and right. you could see her bone marrow through her skin, I'd be like, okay, get the fuck out of here. Like, I don't know what's going on. But but th that's what it describes. That's how fair they're so fair that they're transparent. Th there are yeah. numerous things like that that praise fair skin. It it also says that the virgins will have large eyes, which means that if you have an Asian fetish, you know, you're you're done. But in any case, th th there's so many. Uh, like uh, these aspects of it, uh, you know, all of them are still there. They're in the hadith. It, it's impossible to, I think, clearly um, make a demarcation. But, but Armin, you're right. For in terms of overtly saying it, mm. the, the way that it overtly talks about the misogyny and homophobia and yeah. um, slavery and all of that, it you know, it doesn't overtly say anything about uh, right. racism. And I don't but, think at that time, I mean, it does, it, uh, don't, people were would have hide something like this, like do, uh, dog whistles and stuff weren't a thing back then. Because if you were, if you, if you were actually racist, uh, you would be like, you know, there would be no point in hiding it because of, people of course would be dog whistles yeah. were a thing. They yeah. were a thing. Like, you know, you say, you say, well, we treat, we're going to treat like in the Umayyads, right? The Umayyads, what they did was. That oh Christians, a majority of the Umayyad uh, caliphate that the, they ruled over Christians, a majority of them were Christians. But yes, you can you can do it as long as you do the jizya, you pay the jizya tax, and the Muslims, you know, they're going to pay the zakah, right? And no, it's but, fine, it's okay. But that was a dog whistle. It, it, of course, Christians had a lot more. No, but they were anti-Christian. They weren't high, They weren't shy about the fact that the Christians were inferior to Muslims. They weren't like, "Oh, you're equal," but secretly, no, you're. Uh, no, they, a, were, they were like, "No, we need to humiliate these motherfuckers so that they know their place." And they were do, open no, about that, it. No, that's Sorry. the Abbasids did that. The Umayyads yeah. won. Anyway, we're getting distracted here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a different topic. <laughs> it's a fun topic, but it's a different topic. Yeah. So, yeah. but but Halima, I wanted to get back to. 
uh, so you know we've we've talked about all the politics and everything, but just really you know we started out with the personal story. So you started wearing the job. Yeah. You, you were there. Are two things that I think you you went. You became a TV reporter. So what was it in you that drove you to get involved Wait, in I that? Didn't hear if you uh, you oh. got cut off a bit. Sorry, start your question again. Sorry. Sure. So uh, you know one of the things is your trajectory was when you were growing up. Uh, you went into journalism and you became a TV reporter for. Uh, Kenyan state television. Um, at this time, you were also struggling with your faith, and and you eventually lost your faith as well. And uh, in addition to that, there was the estrangement with the family. So, uh, can, can you talk about what that was like? All of those experiences and and how they came together for you, and <coughs> what did you go through? Well, it's <coughs> it's a very long story, so I'll try and make it a little bit short. Uh, basically, I rebelled a lot. And when I say I rebelled a lot, is I didn't rebel against education. I rebelled towards education. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I rebelled against my family and our traditions and the hijab and all that kind of stuff. But I rebelled towards education. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in college, I was in journalism college. I remember I, I was living in the uh, in the college hostels. And I, I had already like dropped the hijab, but when I go home, I put it back on. And uh, I remember I used to stay on even when uh, we were we had summer breaks and just sneak back into the hostels because I didn't want to go home. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and and yeah, so and then I went on and lived a, a, a sort of a independent life on my own, and I uh, negotiated. To, to uh, which was kind of uh, like it was unexpected and unheard of and um, uh, that sort of thing. And I didn't have very good finances at the time, but I really just wanted to go live on my own. And um, what happened then was is I was I, I was told no, obviously, and then I was uh, put through. Um, uh, how do you say that? Rukia, Rukia. Rukia, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That you mentioned, um, yeah, and this lasted about four days where I was locked in, and there was a lot of Quran reading, and uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, the version of Rukia that that Somali Muslims practice is a bit is a bit weird. Uh, you there's the can, imams can you would explain uh, s- what Rukia is just for the audience. Okay, uh, for me, I didn't even know it's called Rukia because in Somali we call it Quran Sar, which is like literally meaning that the Quran is being, re- it's Quran therapy of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't want yeah. to call it therapy, but yeah, of sorts. It's when you balance uh, it on your head to practice your posture. <laughs> 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 Yeah, go ahead. And you have uh, the family would would make a little bit of a feast, and you have all these uh, sheikhs, the local sheikhs, that or, or somebody who is an imam in, in a mosque would come to the house, and they'll be reading Quran the entire day. They spit in a bowl of water. You have to drink that bowl of water, which is disgusting. Um, and so there, there was there was that whole. I did go through that. That lasted four days. It wasn't uh, very interesting. And then I completely moved up after the four days because the Quran didn't work on me. Wow. Oh, so it's it's almost kind of like an... It sounds a bit like a milder version of an exorcism. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but there was also physical beatings. What um, the hell? What? Oh, so it's yeah. not a milder version. It's probably <laughs> no. worse. It's a uh, worse version of an exorcism. Yeah, I was asked uh, in the living room in in our flat ruby to sit and and all these guys are reading the quran and then there's a guy who's got um it's not really a stick it's more like a, a pipe a water pipe thingy oh, and he's bitting me and he's saying that you know i have gin and the gin needs to speak and the my gin isn't speaking at that moment uh, or whatever gin i had or i didn't believe i did gin is like a demon so, for people who don't know a demon, yeah. Yeah, a demon in, in me or, or something. And then at some point it got to reading the Quran with a, with a, with a, you know, the, like the to- toilet paper roll? That, <laughs> okay. The, the pipe toilet paper roll thingy and put it in my ear and read it so loudly. 
<laughs> kind of didn't work. So anyway, after four days of that, I completely moved and I never looked back. Four days, Jesus. Okay, so, so so apparently what you're supposed to do so that the people stop beat. I think this is how it works. Let me know. By the way, can you sit, come a little bit to your left? More a little bit to your left. Okay, yeah. Um, so I think the way the the way. Yeah. Oh uh, no, actually, more to your left. Yeah, that's great. Ah. Perfect. Yeah, good, 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 good. Um, so I think the way that uh. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think what you're supposed to, they're trying to beat you and intimidate you until you actually start speaking in a in a like a devil kind of voice and say like yes, this is the devil I'm speaking right now. They just want you to do that so that they stop beating you, uh, like so to make it sound seem like it worked, right? So basically, what you're supposed to do is like talk on behalf of the demon inside you and be like yes, this is the this is the gen speaking now. Oh, stop! Like you have to, like you have to act along. You have to play yeah, the part. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I should have been a little bit more strategic and known that that's what they were looking for. And but I was in my head, I was quite rebellious. Still, I kind of was like, it ain't touching me. It's it, this. This is not working on me. You guys are wasting your time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, somebody didn't give you the memo. Like everybody, like yeah, we know. I this. didn't get the memo. <laughs> yeah, you just have to pretend like you're the yeah. <laughs> should have known that. <laughs> <laughs> like, god damn it, girl. Yeah, we know this is all bullshit, but you just have to. If you want us to stop beating you, just say you're the gen and then we could all go home. Yeah. It's been four this days about <laughs> how, how, how old were you around this? Was this around the time of college, school? Yeah, I just, I just like uh, had finished my last year of college. It was around, uh, I was about 20, 22. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> 20, 22 actually, yeah. And I, yeah, go on. No, no, hold on, Armin. No, no, I wasn't saying anything, yeah. Oh, Armin <sighs> wasn't saying anything. Sorry, glitch. My apologies, Armin. Yeah, and I, I, I got a little, a little uh, uh, sales job, which was just uh, giving me a few, a few, a few, you know, some money. And I, I thought that it would have been a nice negotiation because already my family knew I was quite rebellious, and I had already brought shame and all that kind of stuff um but yeah it didn't happen and oh yeah i think what triggered was when i tried to save this child um she was four and she was uh, going to be uh, circumcised mm. and um I, I didn't have a proper plan. I was just, I, you know, I was broke. And I, I, I thought that if I just take her out of the house on that day and, uh, you know, the chance to have the circumciser, you know, she was ready, would be gone. And it, that's, it, it does haunt me yeah. to, mm. to, to this day um, because I couldn't really save her. Uh, I came back with her quite late in the evening and... <clears throat> Yeah, it's still, yeah, I was in a lot of trouble. I was uh, in a lot of trouble. So that's what triggered the whole uh, um, uh, Rukia thing. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I was, <clears throat> that's why I was asking you whether you were in college because I, I thought that I was wondering if that had anything to do with it the, when you tried to save the four year old child from FGM and you, you weren't successful that then, but. Obviously, it's not your fault. I mean, you know that. No, it was around the same week, actually. Just just after I'd done that with a child, and it, it kind of didn't succeed. The child w was taken uh, uh, from Nairobi to now northeastern Kenya for uh, for circumcision. And, yeah, I was feeling a little sad about that. And I uh, then I, you know, um, my mom was convinced that, that I needed uh, Quran therapy. Um mm. Uh, how, so, how, so how basically, just to summarize, you tried to save a child from uh, from being uh, from cutting some people cutting off her clitoris, and the reaction was like, "Okay, you you're possessed by a freaking demon, and we need to exercise you because you wanted yep. to save a child." Okay, just yes, to summarize so, for people. Yes. Okay, <laughs> that's that's basically yeah. That's, that's okay. basically so, yeah. What is the, uh, how come, so th this is kind of interesting in the sense that, uh, I mean, it's tragic, but uh, FGM in Kenya, where you were, um, how common is it? Because in Somalia, it's up to like over 98%, right? Uh, but yeah. 
Now, in Kenya, is it the same rates, and does it differ between the 70% Christian population versus the provinces where it's predominantly Muslim? Um, there are Christian populations that also practice FGM in Kenya. You have the Maasai, the Samburu, uh, the Kuria. Okay, sorry, these are going to sound all weird to you guys, but, you no, know, those fine. are names of tribes. And, and they do practice, but I think what they have in common is some... Some Kushite tribes, Kushitic tribes, okay, Kenya's tribes are divided into Bantu, Nilotic, and Kushites. So Kushites have all of them practice FGM, but you do have other tribes that do. So it's it's a little bit less in some communities and a lot high in, in other communities and in other tribes. Like the Somalis, it's really high. Like nobody escapes. Right. Almost. So so you had people in your family, everybody who, who had undergone FGM? Yeah, I have undergone FGM when I was six. Oh, oh you also went to underwent. So it. why yeah, did okay. you, why, why, why are you different from people around you? Like, what makes you like, be against this? Like, how did you manage to escape that kind of brainwashing? Are you just like naturally different or like, did you, were you exposed? I don't to certain... know. I don't huh? Oh, no, I think I asked myself that question and I kind of tried to create the backstory um, after I became like consciously, I don't believe. I was like, okay, even back then when I was rebelling against that or when I was uh, reading books when nobody's reading books, um, mm. I used to go to the library alone and, 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 and I know it sounds weird, but yeah, I don't know. I think, I think it's, I just, I just didn't agree and i kept on just going and i did the best i could uh, to survive every situation and mm. here we are now i don't consider myself a victim now yeah. um but yeah it was, it Why was, not? was you, you had your you had your you were cut as a child how come you how is it how are you not a victim uh because because that happened when i was six I was a victim at six. Oh, okay. I'm not okay. a victim now. I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I mean, you said in your uh, email to me that you don't look at yourself as a victim, you look at yourself as a survivor. What, yeah. Why so, is that important not to see yourself as a victim? Because I'm trying to do something about it now um, using my, uh, I can't get into details about my journalism at the moment, but I'm, I'm kind of busy with something to do with FGM as well. Uh, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, with my poetry as well, I do a bit of activism with FGM. Um, I try to help uh, or to understand uh, or to counter the narrative as much as I can. Uh, so I, that's why I feel like I'm, I'm not a victim. When that was happening, I couldn't make a decision. But mm -hmm. now I can so I think is it is it is it about not letting the, your environment to define you, but you in defining your environment, like trying exactly. to exactly okay, taking control exactly. and making your own destiny. Okay, okay, okay. When, when yeah. you when you uh, when you tried to save your your niece from uh, FGM, right, the four year old yeah. girl, um, how much of it had to do with what you went through? <clears throat> and you experiencing it, you not wanting her to go through the same thing, or did you I think guess that consciously, not not necessarily consciously, but at that time, uh, um, because I was a little bit naive in some senses, like I kind of I could have made a better plan, you know, um, but like it was subconscious reaction. I don't know, probably, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe I could have kidnapped. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No, you, were, you, you were already broke. You were very young. <laughs> how, yeah. how are you going to save a kid from that kind of... Uh, I don't know. I just wanted to. Uh, you know, I just wanted I to Do you out. beat yourself up for not being able to I save do. her? That one uh, really... Yeah, that one... Uh, that one really haunts me because recently I found her photo uh, somewhere in my old staff. And I was like, oh, shit, 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 shit. So it, 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 it still does bother me. Mm, but there's nothing really you could have done. Like nothing. I know. 
So don't beat yourself. By the way, we didn't we we forgot that we should have defined FGM for some of our audience because I know most of our audience already knows, but we always get new audience. We should have mentioned this, Ali. FGM means uh, female, female genital genital mutilation. mutilation. Basically, it's the act of cutting. Uh, uh, the clitoris and again a lot of, there's a huge debate whether this is Islamic or not a lot of people saying this is an African thing some people saying no it's an Islamic thing uh, it's a mix of both isn't it like if we really do have to talk about that I really, okay, really now that you bring it up okay um, <clears throat> peculiar to the Somali community I'm just gonna say that mm. is a version or uh, some form of uh, sheikhs and imams saying, oh, FGM, don't do the bad one. It's really bad. Yeah, that's type three. Type three is where there's infibulation. There's the, the vagina is soon up. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sewing to do oh, closed, up, closed up. And there's only a little bit of a hole left for urine. And uh, there's a lot of medical complications that women who have done that face. So don't do that bad one, but do the sunnah one, you know, it's it. And that one is... Sunnah uh, means according to Islamic um, practices. But yeah, right. so basically they're telling their congregation, uh, <clears throat> don't do the... I don't want to say one is barbaric and the other one isn't. Both of them are barbaric. All of them are barbaric. So... Mm -hmm. Don't do the really, really type 3 uh, extreme one, but do the type 1, which is uh, still a cut on on the clitoris, mm -hmm. or reduce the clitoris, or so, so to speak. And so I, the people who say there's not a, a, a religious connection, I have personally read one hadith that yeah. says something about the two cut parts. There's mm -hmm. several. Uh, yeah. yeah, and so I don't believe, especially when uh, religious uh, uh, leaders are using it, to, you know, to to drum up support for it. So right. Yeah. I so, so let me just run through the. the can I just doctrines? quickly one sentence? I think the no. way the accurate way of saying this is that um, it's just like it's like slavery existed before Islam. We're not saying Islam invented slavery. We're saying Islam condones slavery, right? So yeah. with the, with FGM as well, we do know that FGM is not was not invented by Islam, but the fact is that Islam does condone FGM. Yeah, right? there's two things I have to say for for people who say that um, FGM right. is un-Islamic. Yeah. They, they they say that FGM is un-Islamic because a it predates Islam, mm -hmm. and b it isn't in the Quran. Guess what else predates Islam and is not in the Quran? Male circumcision. But nobody argues that male circumcision is an Islamic, even oh, yeah. though in the it's same way. Yeah. Male, it only appears in the Hadith. So the way that it is in the Sunni schools of thought, in the four madhab, uh, right, the, the Hanafis, uh, the uh, uh, Malikis, uh, and the Hanbalis, they, they all think that uh, FGM is... Uh, not obligatory, not mandatory. Okay, so Ali, you have to explain. These are three of the four Sunni Islamic schools of thought. Is that what you yes, just mentioned? Yes, yes, they call they're called the Mathab, the four Mathabs in the Sunni Islamic schools of thought. Um, so the, there are four of them. There's a Hanafi school of thought. There's Shafi. There's Maliki, and there's Hanbali. So Hanbali, uh, Maliki, and um, the Hanafi, they all uh, think that FGM is not mandatory but preferred. Right? Hmm. None of them ban it. The Shafi'i sect, right, which is uh, most prevalent in places like Somalia, in places no. like Indonesia, Mal Malaysia, or, you mm -hmm. know, Egypt. So they consider FGM mandatory. So in mm -hmm. this major school of thought that, that actually affects the, the largest Muslim population country in the world is Indonesia. The rates of FGM are about 86%. Yeah. The largest Arab uh, 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 country in the world, population-wise, is Egypt. Egypt. The rates of FGM are up to 90%. 90 percent. Okay, Ninety fucking percent, people in Egypt. Ninety percent, so, Jesus. So, so this is so FGM is definitely Islamic. Yes, it predates Islam, like male circumcision. Yes, it's not in the Quran. Slavery like also predates Islam, but it's Islamic. Okay. Exactly. So, so there's no this idea that it's not Islamic, and just because other people do it isn't uh, it doesn't really hold a lot of water. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so, so one of the other activists. By the way, been... one thing we need to point out: the whole like 
if you think about the quote unquote logic behind <laughs> FGM, um, I'm losing your logic very loosely here, but it makes it even uh, more ridiculous is that um, the whole point is to remove the pleasure that the women are feeling from sex. The whole point is to stop her from having premarital sex. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and yeah, I mean, she's a, just a <laughs> baby making machine. She, there's no point in making her enjoy it while she makes that's the whole. Yeah, it's so, it's so I mean, how that's so fu- so fucked up. I no, mean, but the reason, you know, the reason for this, what? the reason just from a, an anatomical point of view, the clitoris is the only organ in the entire human body, male or female, that is exclusively dedicated to sexual pressure. It has no reproductive pleasure, function. Yeah, yeah pleasure. Uh, the 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 penis has reproductive function and excretion function, right? The mm. the vagina has reproductive function as well. The urethra has excretion function, but the clitoris has no function, no reproductive, no excretion. The only purpose of the clitoris is sexual pressure, nothing else. Pleasure, so, yeah. So then, and, like, um, what's the point? Let's so it's basically the- like a party button, right? right? And it's and women get it, and men don't have anything that's exclusively directed towards that. And so that the makes patriarchy it, decides, let's take that pleasure away. <laughs> God gave that. If you believe in God, God gave women the only organ in the entire human anatomical spectrum, right? With the, the range that is dedicated exclusively to sexual pleasure and nothing else. Right? You know, that when, is what when, makes when, it the, so when, you, when, you're, when your religion says like, hey, let's remove this, let's remove pr- pleasure... At that point, don't you like think like, are we not the baddies here? Like, don't you think like, hey, we're against pleasure. Like, what does that say? Again? What does that say about you? Like, don't you? Doesn't that make you reflect a little bit? Or like, what the bacon, fuck is alcohol, wrong with us? Clitorises, just like okay, yeah, everything. All that stuff has to go. It all comes in the afterlife with those transparent bone marrow virgins. <sighs> that's that's when it comes to the pleasure. But it's just this. Yeah, this is something that just anyway, drives me insane. Um, I, I can't even imagine what you went through. A, another person from Somalia, uh, an activist who really worked, and I know you wanted to talk about her today, um, For and, and she talked a lot about FGM. She talked about genital cutting and babies in general, I mean, for, for boys yeah. and girls, but especially girls, um, is Ayan Hirsi Ali. Um, and oh, yeah. we were talking to uh, Autumn Sharif and you know, just uh, in the last episode, and she was yeah. saying that she is hated, she's essentially a pariah in the Somali community. Absolutely, yeah, you yeah. have a different view. The thing is, even I, when I first, uh, I don't know if you guys watched this interview which I did with Mariam when I first uh, came out uh, of the closet, uh, with, with my Mariam atheism. Namazi. Mariam Namazi, yes. CDMB. Yeah. yeah, and I kind of almost like distanced myself, which was really weird because even when I was in Kenya and 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 um, still hiding with my non-belief, I did I did I did write essays to to her website. I you know I write I wrote how I admired her and how she's opened a space for women, and oh she's she's my hero. Obviously, I don't, I don't necessarily the sun. Is that like whitewashing my face right now? Shall I step back? No, no, you look fine. Is that good? Yeah, yeah. It's a li- no, actually, it's a bit too bright. <laughs> it's a little bright. Yeah, yeah. that's what yeah. I thought. Yeah, it's oh, fine. there you go. There so, you go. Okay. Okay. That's better, yeah? So mm-hmm. anyway, she, um, she's my hero. I, I don't necessarily uh, agree with her political things, but... Uh, I've, I've admired Ayan, uh, and Ayan took the brunt of the hate from especially Muslim Somali community. I mean, she's mm-hmm. taken the brunt of the hate from all Muslims, but she was especially she's still especially hated by Somali Muslims. Absolutely, yeah. being associated with her even makes you, uh, you know, like uh, uh, even saying that you like Ayan or you agree with Ayan makes you. So, so yeah. that yeah, that that brings me. Wait, wait, you got cut. Can you can you repeat that last part? Um, you guys are also that. getting cut out. Is it okay. is it my internet? Uh huh. Yeah, okay. I think it is. It's okay. It'll it's it'll, okay. We'll, repeat. It'll be fine yeah. in the final one. But yeah, go ahead. you go ahead. Sorry. 
I, I didn't hear what you asked. Uh, I said you I mentioned that mentioning even I am will get you like uh, it's yes. such a yeah yeah such a like negative uh, reaction from uh, from the larger Somali community. Mm -hmm. Like no, it's like mentioning Ayan is like oh you know right uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's kind so of like Salman Rushdie in some other circles, right? Yeah, like yeah. Ayan is like the devil reincarnate, like for yeah. a lot of people, especially in African uh, Islamic yeah. African countries. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. So, uh, but but yeah. the thing is, so and this kind of brings me to um, the ex-Muslim community in Somalia, Kenya, and you know, just generally, uh, you, where where you come from. So the ex-Muslims are they're very closeted. They're underground. As much as everybody hated Ayan and openly nobody could say it, Ayan, you said she is your hero. Um, we've had people, uh, Noon Benson has said that she really admired her. And same thing, not, a lot of us don't agree with all of her politics. That's fine. Um, yeah. But there's, so it did, it, did, it did come to you. I think Ayan, Hershey Ali, whatever she was saying, eventually when you were younger, you were taught to hate Ayan, but as you grew older, that message did resonate with you and probably with a lot of the underground ex-Muslims in uh, Somalia and Kenya. So what is it like for ex-Muslims? Under Are you in touch with any of them? Are there any networks? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Unfortunately, I can't get into details of what kind of places they're underground in. Of, of course, course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, but there's a really... Uh, and, and, you know, it, okay, there's... People who use online, uh, yeah, who are online, and maybe do a little bit of activism, and they uh, they will use fake profile of sorts. Those are the guys on the top layer. There's another layer down under, which is full of guys who who do not, who will keep on changing their you know on online profiles every other week because maybe it will be discovered and whatnot. And they will be super careful what kind of groups they would join. And they'll be super paranoid about who they tell anything. But they're there. Mm. They're there. And we're, 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 kinda, we're just kind of touching the surface of being plugged into them right now. And, and the interesting part is, this is how people identify each other, especially from the ex-Muslims from, from Somali background. Mm. They identify each other with a few code words. You know, like um, waq. Wak is that one cool word? Oh yeah, we and, we know about Wak from Noon from Noon Benson. She has a yes, podcast called Wak yes, Nation. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. Um, I follow it. I follow it. And and Noon and I also are, uh, uh, you know, together in those underground places. What does so it mean? We recognize each other on the surface, but we know. Yeah, can you explain the Wak uh, phenomenon to or the mythology to the, the audience again for those who are unfamiliar? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, Somali, Somali language has uh, an oral narrative that has been told over generations. So personally, because I'm not from really from Somalia, I've heard this narrative as well, that Wak was a sky god, uh, a mountain god, mm. and, and, and rain god. Um, I th no, wait, 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 wait. I, got, I got that wrong. Wak was the bigger god of all these other gods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like the supreme being. <laughs> mm. But what's happening, I think, among Somali free thinkers and Somali atheists, is like they would invoke that to counter Allah. It's like, it's like just, you know, use that as a code word um, to counter the existence of Allah and say that that's not Allah, we, we're going back, way back. And in the online interactions, that is being used right now as a way to recognize each other and as a way to send each other messages that, hey, I'm a free thinker. Hey, uh, there's even different versions of it. Like um, I've heard from some of them, and maybe maybe this is not like across the board, that mm. if they want to send out the message that I am a free thinker or uh, an atheist and I'm also gay, they would make Waq a female. So they'll say Waq. Ah. Ah. This, like, <laughs> this is just if, they, if, 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 if it's a if it's a if it's a woman um, 
and who wants to send out the message that she is a lesbian and at the same time uh, an atheist, she'd use another mythical character in the fairy tales called uh, Aruelo. Aruelo was okay. supposed to okay. be um, a feminist in, in Somali folk folklore. Uh, uh, so if you see we... people using online... Sorry? What's the god? What's the what's people? What's the god that they use for atheism? This is so funny, God for atheism. <laughs> but I wanna I wanna use that god as symbolism for stuff. Like what is that? Walk W A A Q. No, no, walk yeah. was for something else. So for the ath- which god was for atheism? Symbol for atheism. No, but you see, the thing is, walk did exist in the mythology of of Somalis. Right. Mm-hmm. However, right now in the in the in the current internet use, they are using that to recognize each other as atheists. This is the right. thing. So I just want to. Yeah, I understand that, but 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 it seems yeah. like they're using different gods for different meanings, right? So I just want to make sure, like, what is exclusively used for atheism, or is no, no, it a no, no, certain Armin, kind? Saying that they're using walk uh, throughout. It's just that if they're gay. Uh, then they're right. also adding wakat. Okay, so what to do you add? To make it female. To make I understand that. But what do you add to this wak like, thing? Like, it's just add? wak. For atheism, it's just wak. Oh, That's okay, it. okay, okay. Mm. So it's a, it's a signal. It's or not wak that they're saying... queen. Like, if you see wak queen, somebody using uh, a, a pseudonym online says wak queen. So that becomes very clear to you that they're A, atheist, and B, um, probably lesbian. Probably yeah, it. so the, it, I I just wanted God. the big atheist goddess. That's fantastic. the bigger thing over here that I want the <laughs> just the audience to understand that the consequences for just saying that you think differently, you believe differently, uh, that you you you're an atheist, you're a free thinker, you're lesbian, you're gay. The consequences are so dire that. Yeah. This is, they have to come up with codes to speak to each other online, you know, even, uh, are even if they're Are we talking about the consequences in Somalia or in Kenya? In, in, both. Also, the guys who live in the West, you would be surprised the amount of people who are uh, from Somali background, who live in the West, who are deep, deep in the closet with their beliefs and with, whether they're LGBT as well, deep in the closet with everything. Because... Um, the survey I did, it, it's still going on. This I'm still getting responses. Um, I had this particular question. What's your main reason for being anonymous? And I can say 90% are saying my mom, my family, my mom, my family. And majority mm-hmm. of the time it's my mom, actually. So I'm, I'm trying to understand that it's, of course, people have loyalties to their families definitely uh, and it's a difficult thing to navigate but a lot of people who are in the closet are not just in Somalia right they are in free okay. countries can we put can we put this in perspective by comparing these three together what would uh-huh. be the consequences in Somalia what would be the consequences in Kenya and what would be the consequences for Somalis living in western countries coming out openly Okay, Somalis, if I can just, I don't want to generalize, of course there are wonderful families out there and there are horrible families out there, but Somalis are like a very tight-knit, um, uh, hard community, if I may, and forgive me if it's, it, if it's generalizing. Um, and so whenever uh, a person says that they don't believe uh, and because their identity, the Somali identity and Islam has been so intertwined that um, they will automatically face complete uh, ostracization from family, from friends, from community. Mm. So those are the consequences for let's say the guys who live in the in the west or in the west in the okay west. ostracization yeah. and abandonment from community and being disowned by your family that would be the yeah. somalis living in western countries right yeah. so yeah. what about somalis living in kenya let's say a somali coming in kenya uh, coming out as an uh, gay and atheist what happens to you in kenya okay <clears throat> Oh, you got cut. 
in no. Kenya, let's say, okay, uh, in in like like I was explaining that. Boss, are you there? Yeah. Am I there? Yes. Am I back? On. Yes, you're okay. back. Yeah. So like uh -huh. I, I was explaining earlier that God is really big in Africa, right. uh, in Kenya. Uh, if it's not the, the uh, if it's not Allah, it's the Christian God. So I'm um, imagining a situation where somebody uh, would also lose their family in Kenya, but at the same time they will not have state protection or there are no systems to protect them with their safety. So if the family wants to harm them, Nobody will give a hoot. Oh shit! Okay, and in some, I'm, I'm guessing when we go now to the next level, of Somalia, the government will also join in in harming you. No, that no, that's yeah. Yeah. There's actually right now there's a guy, there's a university professor who made a <clears throat> a Facebook post, just uh, telling he it was something really harmless to be honest he said like instead of praying to allah for for water or whatever why don't you guys get into irrigation and and start fixing your problems and he he got arrested he's serving jail right now two what? and a half years yeah in somalia in somalia so he's like hey so instead of praying why don't you do something useful for water instead of praying for rain why don't you do something actually useful with your hand and he's in prison for that in somalia yes Holy yeah. shit! Oh no! Oh he's, he's, no! He's in prison for two and a half years. Is he in prison right now? Yeah, uh, right many? now. As we, in fact, uh, at around when we now in June, uh, it it was um, beginning of May that this happened. I could send you guys the link. It's somewhere on on um on on my uh, stuff. I was in touch with one of the guys who is in touch with him. Is him. he an atheist? Do we he know if he's an atheist? To, we think he's an atheist, but he can't say. He can't say. What's his name? Uh, Jam. Hang on, I'm gonna check it. Jama, Jama somebody. I don't have his name at the top of my head, but Jama somebody. Jama. Okay, just yeah. to, uh, while you're looking it up, just to, just to put things to summarize for, for people. So Somalis in Western countries, they fear abandonment by the community and their families if they come out as atheists or gays or something like that. But at least if the if their family wants to harm them, they have the police to protect them. Hopefully, uh, yeah. in, in Kenya, if uh, it's the same, it's the same thing. All of that, plus if the family wants to hurt you, probably the police is not going to show up to help you. In Somalia, the police might might show up, but the police might show up to hurt you as well. So that's the different levels of, um, of uh, oppression we're facing. Yes. Um, okay, so if you, when you were like, okay, so in Kenya, when you were like being beaten for four days and you were being exercised, is that a or is that a can that be used as a Exercise, verb? Exercise, yeah. Yeah, yeah I so guess if, so. If, if, you, if you managed to call the police and told them like, hey, they are, these people have hold me up in here and they're beating me, please come help me. What would, they, what would the police do? Like if you called the police in Kenya? Nothing? But at that time, I didn't even call the police. But at this time, I did call the police because my family came after me. Even after I left and lived on my own and married a non-Muslim and had it had two children already wow uh, my brother came and he was looking for my younger sister because i apparently uh, sent i i made sure that they also rebelled so something like that basically what it was is i helped them it, when they didn't um, um you know want to live in a it wanted to drop the hijab and all that kind of stuff but uh, that's a different story. <laughs> but anyway, my brother did come with a group of people and I did call the police and the police didn't arrive uh, for two and a half hours. Oh, wait, what was your brother doing? He wanted to do what? Like He, he was a bit just intimidating. Like he, he came with five guys to my house. In where was this? In uh, uh, in, in Kenya, in Nairobi. In Nairobi, okay. So f uh, t uh, he came with five guys yeah. to like to, to and what was he saying? What the hell? This is scary. Oh, you're getting cut again. Got that? Europe's connection is. Uh, got... Yeah, you're yeah. back. Now. Yeah, what were you saying? What was your brother saying? Oh, you got cut again. Hello? Hello? I don't know what's yeah. going on. 
this, is, right. uh, this is this is some amazing stories. Yeah, uh, sorry to the audience for for the audio issues. This happens sometimes. Like, um, sure. there you go. You're back, Halima. Okay, you're back. Yeah, but okay. Uh, wait. Is this my side of things? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, my brother did come to my house with five feet. People. Um, must have been around, you know, just after dinner, knocked on my door. I kind of thought that it was, uh, you know, just something to do with mom because I didn't, I hadn't been, I had been estranged, so I hadn't kept in touch with anybody. And so um, he wasn't really violent outrightly, but he was very intimidating. Mm. And calling, uh, uh, calling me like, uh, well, calling my husband. What will your kafir husband do for you? Kafir means non-believer. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing that that's an insult. It says a lot that that's the insult that he no, just, it, like. Yeah. So it was like, what will your kafir husband do for you? He's just on the computer. My husband was on the Skype at the moment. He wasn't uh, in the country. Oh, kafir husband. See, it's so interesting that the worst thing he could think of to go for as an attack. For, to your husband was kafir. That says so much about the mentality of what their what the what their problem was. Are you in a are you at all in a relation? You know, what's your relationship with your family now? Like like your parents, your my young. Oh God, it's getting cut. It can touch, and both of them are actually leaving. Can you repeat that part? Because, Ali, part. Ali, you're muted. Um, can you repeat that part again? My youngest. Sisters and I are are in touch, and and, and I mean we we're, we're in touch well, and we we keep we we support each other. However, when I came out and started doing activism, one of my sisters, no. Oh God, this is such a good part, and it's keep getting cut. She, you repeat that last part. When, okay, so your your brother, your youngest brother, is in touch, but once you start doing your activism, one of your sisters, what? Um, I'm in touch with two of my sisters, but once I came out and became a, started doing a little bit of activism and being vocal and doing interviews and that kind of stuff, one of my sisters is not happy about that. She, 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 she the relationship is strained at best. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 That's anyway, uh, unfortunately too common a story with uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them. That there is a strained. Often, it's I've, I've noticed that sometimes it's a phase, and eventually people come around once it becomes more normalized. But yeah. uh, it still takes a while. And it's a very painful thing to go through, especially yeah. with yeah. You know, siblings and family that you're close to. Yeah, yeah. it's. Uh, I I wanted to. Uh, Armin, did you have any? Because they're both. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, both of my younger sisters, how we we became even close is the fact that they also don't live very Islamic lives. Uh, they, uh, you know. Uh, they have boyfriends who are not Muslim. They uh, drink, you know, and they they're not really. Uh, they don't have wear the hijab, and so they're kind of like living a free life, but detached from the family, the rest of the family. So we have right. each other, kind of. So yeah. yeah, that's why it's a bit difficult for me that she um, that I, that's a relationship I do want to work on and see if yeah. it works out. I hope you. I hope yeah. you. I hope you make it work somehow. Yeah, I hope so yeah. too. Yeah. Um, try. Halima, you are a poet, and I know that we yes. talked about um, having you read one of your poems, and you chose the one that you chose that we discuss, and I, I'll let you say it. But considering that we just heard your story uh, about FGM and oh, all the yeah. work that you're doing, can we can we also hear the second one? Would you be okay with reading two of them? Yeah. In fact, okay. the 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 one the first poem is uh, the vagina poem. Um, yeah, it's tied to the second one because that that's like uh. kind of my answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, in one I tell what happened, and in the other one I'm like, "Fuck you." So um, I, hope I hope it doesn't your connection doesn't get cut in the middle of you reading the poem. If it does get cut. I then know. I would send me a video separately of you reading the poems and I'll just attach it here, okay? So this 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 particular piece is called uh, the vagina poem. Um, sometimes I call it the vagina piece or the vagina poem. It's an anti-FGM. Um, and so it goes like this. 
My vagina has a story to tell. A story of hell that befell on these, oh my sacred well. This is a story we must dwell on about my soul severed and my flesh butchered and my blood sputtered. I was six years old when I was told it was time. It's a story of traditions not worth a dime. At six years old at the time, my crime was already decided that when I reach prime, I was already I was at risk of freely distributing these, my sacred dime. So my vagina needed to be sent a message. A message that when I come of age, it shall stay shut only to salvage an image for a culture so savage. And I'm here feeling the rage of the blade as it hit my flesh and the sound of the cut engraved in my brain as my blood sputtered across my thighs. As I let out a screeching scream piercing through lawns far away, down there lay a piece of my flesh to be thrown away. And today the bullshit they told me at childhood is one that I need to trash down for good. Because, and it is something that needs to be understood. Because when I understood, like really understood, I stood there with the rage. And I'm here feeling the rage of the blade as it hit my flesh and the sound of the cut engraved in my brain. And as my blood sputtered across my thighs, as I let out a screeching scream piercing through lungs far away, down there lay a piece of my flesh to be thrown away. So that's it for the vagina piece. I normally do um, connect these two pieces together. The uh, second piece is called um, Dear Patriarchy. And it goes like... Basically, it's my answer to the scenarios of, of, of FGM. And it goes like this. Dear Patriarchy, What's your deal really? Because when I woke, I wondered, Hmm, why is that so much power over my body, my soul, my vagina, and my feisty hot head of rebellion? Dear Patriarchy, Is it possible that you're a tad bit fearful of me because I do see through you? So you feed me lies, but in my mind I always questioned. And you told me I was less, but in my gut I always doubted. So you had me in chains, but my body constantly rejected. So you told me more lies, and more narrative, and more religion, and more society. Wow. Thank you so much, okay. Lima. This is, like, yeah. amazing. <laughs> I... Um, Yeah, I, I'm going to, like, just wanted to uh, summarize this. I mean, th this is, recover. Uh, are you recovering? You're okay, recover. <laughs> yeah. I, are, you, are you going to, do you have these poems out? Have you recited and performed them and put them out on YouTube or anywhere online? Uh, uh, actually, what I do, what, what I do is I do go to small po intimate poetry readings in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly the places I do but there's a few pieces that are out there on on YouTube uh, yeah. and I do have a website um, I for my poetry I call myself Anchia so I use Anchia poetry as as the poetry thingy and mm. so uh, I, I would send I would send that to you definitely uh, can you say your website uh, URL here for the audience who's listening Anchia, Anchia 
Unchia Poetry, and that is U N C I A Poetry dot com. Okay, got it. I, I myself don't uh, yet uh, understand, and I'm, this is something that I need to talk to more people about, about um, p- uh, blaming uh, things on uh, patriarchy and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I, I don't understand it, and I'm, and I'm going to have more conversations about it until I learn what the, what the, theor- what the claims are and to just have a, get a better understanding of what what is being said right now. Right now, I just... Mm-hmm. I just um, I, I I notice it a lot, but I haven't de- gotten much into the conversations about what what the argument there is. Mm-hmm. Right? Is it is it just about sexism? For me, sometimes the way I look at it is like I look at it like this invisible power um, that has that has its leg in different parts of society. Not invisible, like we don't believe in the existence of anything invisible but Mm. like there are different aspects of society that just you know um i don't think patriarchy and masculinity are the same thing a lot of people just uh uh, conflate those two Mm. narratives to 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 downplay one sex over the other for me Mm -hmm. um I, I mean, I, I, there are many things that are uh, patriarchal. Is that the right way to say it? And yeah. I know that, and I know that that is the case. Like Islam is, Christianity is, Judaism is, Hinduism is, Buddhism is. But I do wonder if there are many things that could uh, be pointed out that okay, this is you know patriarchal. But I do wonder if there are if the label is being used on too many things where it's there are other sources on places where the source of the problem is something else and uh-huh. the label is being used too loosely on other things where the problem is not patriarchy. Like, I'm not saying patriarchy is not a problem because patriarchy yeah. is a problem. No, wait. That, that's I, I, inevitable. I, know, yeah. I, know, I, I, I think I understand you, Armin. Uh, right. Yes, the, it, I think the problem is that the term itself, or maybe, yeah, the term itself has been used loosely. Right. Uh, especially a lot lately, right? And so maybe that's where where the 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 conflation comes. But so I do like want, I, I think I get what you're saying. Right. No, it's just like I think, for example, when when it comes to atheist activism, for example, right? Mm-hmm. What I notice when it comes to atheist activists is because their hatred for religion has turned into a situation for a lot of atheist activists for where they see everything. To be the fault, every problem in the world to be the fault of religion, for example, right? Like they say, like they over, they over, you, they over, they exaggerate the um, the religious faults, and so basically, just because you're fighting against religion, that doesn't mean that every fucking problem in the world is the fault of religion, right? So when basically when you turn into a hammer, for example. Uh, everything looks like a nail to them, right? So, as yeah. an atheist, as an atheist activist, you have to admit, like, with that, you know, there are things in the world that are wrong with the world that has nothing to do with the religion, right? So, I think, ev- so that that's what I noticed in my own activism among our, our atheist activism, and I think like every active, every group of activists has that in their community. Like, if uh, so, for example, feminists, there are a lot of things that are because of sexism. But there are problems in the world that has nothing to do with sexism, right? Um, or like if somebody like, I, I, you, do you know what I'm just saying? Like, I just want yeah. to be careful that not just with feminism. <coughs> I'm just saying every activist group has to be careful uh, not to uh, try to make their the fight that they're fighting or the disease that they're fighting to make that seem like that's the only disease in the world and everything could be somehow related to that disease. I, I think yeah, the thing I, is, that I doesn't mean the that disease doesn't... Yeah, yeah, yeah I was saying... On, yeah, that doesn't mean the disease doesn't exist. That's all exactly. we're saying. Exactly. Is that we... <clears throat> the patriarchal system is it's a reality. There are some people out there that say just because it's wrong... And I agree with you. It's wrongly blamed for everything and it's used as a scapegoat for all kinds of things that may not have to do with it. 
Um, there are other people who react to that and say, oh, that means that the patriarchy is just a myth. It doesn't exist. And that is not, that's obviously no, no, not that's true. That's a myth. That's not yeah, a myth. Yeah. It's not a myth. Obviously, yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah. It, so, it's so, a problem. I just want to make sure that it, it, people don't overuse it. That's yeah, it's, right. it's inevitable. I mean, but people like anti-Semitism is used so loosely. Um, you know, the bigotry, like people calling each other bigots is used so loosely. I and mean, we all get called bigots, right? Oh, this love me. Huh? Yeah. Now that we're talking about terms being used loosely, Islamophobia is one of them. It's yeah, Islamophobia. Just, I find it as an oxymoron, in my opinion. It's just. It, it, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is absolutely. We've been talking about that for a long time. Yeah, I know. But um, I I wanted to like Halim. I just wanted to, uh, to thank you for coming on. I think your story is amazing. But I want to hear her response to me. I would just want to say oh, like. I, okay, go ahead. See, this is patriarchal. You're not even letting her respond. <laughs> no, what's patriarchal is you expected that you will have her respond because you're a man. No, what's what patriarchal? Is... No, no, no. What's patriarchal is me explaining to a woman what patriarchy is. That's what it is. What, what patriarchy is is two oh, guys arguing. While we're mansplaining this to you. Yeah. And we're, we're not mans- letting the woman speak. That's yeah, patriarchy. we're not letting her speak. Look, patriarchy at work right here. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Go on. Oh, see? Now Skype is being patriarchal. Of my they froze. Okay. So, sorry, Halima, I... hold on. You, you got cut. You're going to have to repeat. Did... This is the secret powers the... of... The... Cut, you got Context cut. Of my... Oh, man. Okay, hold on. I uh... Hold on, Halima. Sorry, you got cut. That whole thing got uh, cut. Can you, yeah, can you repeat everything you said? You just got cut. The whole thing got cut. Patriarchy. You're back. Okay, okay. Uh, a bit of a bit of a context for my piece. Mm-hmm. And the context for my piece was uh, when I wrote it. It was kind of like a uh, my fight back and a reply to why FGM was done to me. And so for me, the way I understood why FGM was done to me or to other people who, who is that this is all about making sure, her, you know, that she, she preserves her virginity for a man, um, doesn't also get as much pleasure as, as a man does. So that's how I looked at it when I was. So for me, this piece is connected to FGM piece. In fact, I don't normally separate them. Do you? Okay. Do, does that answer your question in any way? Yeah. In context, yes, it, that makes that makes, makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. I, I always talk about how uh, the you know the whole fetishization of Mary's virginity, just the fact that because she Mary was a virgin, she gave birth to uh, as a virgin, she was pure. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I just can hear because now. Mary was a virgin and she gave birth to uh, uh, the Son of God and she was chaste and innocent because she was a virgin and no man ever touched her. Uh, like that is the basis for victim blaming and uh, the slut shaming. And it's actually a hugely patriarchal thing that is connected to modesty culture, that's connected to everything from the hijab to it, FGM exactly. and to everything. Exactly. So. It is the entire cult. These things, FGM and uh, modesty cult, these are just symptoms of the much bigger thing. And that much bigger thing is what uh, what patriarchy would be. Right, so. Yeah. That's why I was saying that. If sometimes it's, it's, it's kind of an invisible thing. You can't really put a button on it. You say, you know, there is the patriarchy. That it's blue in color and mm. this is how it speaks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's all these ideas sometimes times come together and you see that them as a, like a patriarchal narrative so that for me that's that's the context secular jihadists is an increasingly influential podcast with much of its growing audience in muslim majority countries advocating for atheists secularists and enlightenment thinkers we want to reach out to more people if we reach 500 patrons we will be able to translate our shows into arabic urdu persian bengali malay turkish and other languages in these countries. Help us get there at patreon.com slash sjme.